Hello and welcome to the first ever tribal session of the future of money. Uh, here in the London studio, I am Lita Glyptis. Today we have a, an unusual session, one that we expect will be a lot of fun for the participants and a lot of fun for you guys at home. Um, so much fun that we would like to see it become a cyber staple. So what can you expect? I have leaders, I have pitchers, and I have you at home. The shape of the day will be as follows. I will ask our leaders super quickly to give us a little bit of a hint of what it is they're looking for. Then we will ask our three pitchers to do exactly what it says on the tin, to cast their sights to 2040 and tell us what money will look like. You at home and our leaders here will have inner coins, inner tribe coins, to invest in the future that you don't necessarily find most appealing, but you find most convincing. We are against the clock today. We have a lot to go through. So if you see people talking super fast and trying to be super pithy, you know why. Now, with me today, I have three leaders. I have James Lloyd, who's an MD at City, Lana Schwartz, who's an associate professor from the University of Virginia, and Thomas Schack, who's the chief innovation officer of SWIFT. I have three pitchers, Ruth Vanhofer, partner at Gauss Ventures, Theo Lau, founder of Unconventional Ventures, and Matt Harris, partner at Bain Capital. They're coming from Hong Kong and Washington DC, New Jersey, Charlottesville, New York City, and here in London. We're spanning the globe, and so are you at home. So before we start, 30 seconds from our leaders. James, what are you looking for today? Who's gonna get your vote? What do they need to say to convince you? Well, Lita, uh, firstly, you know, very happy to be here, of course, but I think you, you, you just nailed it on the head when you said we've got folks from the US, from the UK, and of course, uh, I, I'm dialing in from Hong Kong. I guess what I'm looking for, and I'm having you know, been covering fintech and payments in Asia Pacific for many years, I'm, I'm looking to see whether they're accounting for regional differences in their vision uh, for the future of money in 2040, and in particular, the kind of distribution of that vision, right? So thinking of the famous William Gibson quote that the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. I'm keen to see that they're accounting for decoupling, recoupling, regionalization, all of that exciting stuff. So let's Fantastic. See. Thank you, James. What about you, Lana? Well, you know, I'm a uh, academic, so I'm a historian and sociologist of technologies, particularly money technologies and payments. So I will be looking for someone who has the best grasp of both technology, but also society, culture, and what they've able, been able to learn from history. Um, I'm also going to be, you know, this idea is that we're not necessarily looking for the future we want, we're looking for the future that is most realistic. But even with that being the case, I am gonna be looking for someone with some vision of the public good, some creativity around how we can thrive even in the most dire circumstances. Absolutely brilliant. And a, 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 a tall ask for five minutes of pitching. Last but not least, Thomas, what are you looking for? All right, well, it's good to be here as well. And, uh, and today I'm really, really looking for a bold vision uh, that specifically benefits individuals. And I mean that on a, on a global basis. So that would include things like convenience, obviously, uh, but also really necessary things like privacy, which I don't think can be compromised in any scenario. Also, I would like to see proposals that could be progressed over time responsibly. It's okay to change things, but it's never okay to break things. So I think that's a really important part of the uh, proposals today. Absolutely brilliant, and if the challenge was not big enough, I do believe it just got bigger. So with no further ado, we will move to our first pitch. Ruth, the floor, so to speak, is yours. Thank you, Lida, and hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to share my vision of Money 2040. So first of all, before I do that, we need to quickly recap what we have today. We have public money issued by central banks backed by governments and we have private money, for example, cryptocurrencies issued by algorithms and backed by nothing. That could be a vision of money in its own right, to be honest. How do we hold money? Public money is held in bank accounts. It's held in our pockets. Private money is held in digital wallets. And how do we exchange it? We exchange public money with payment systems and we exchange <clears throat> Uh, physically, of course, in our pockets and by our hands, or we use on the private money side uh, own designated systems with their own consensus algorithms. But most importantly, money to a large extent is already invisible. It is visible on our phones, but it's sort of almost invisible in terms of how we spend it. Um, and everything around biometrics and different sciences that allow us to tra transact it easily are already in place. So let me uh, quickly go into my 
sort of three themes for the future. I want to talk first about new types of money. I want to talk about the programmable nature of money. And I want to talk about cross-border money. And I think the big battle here is sovereigns mm -hmm. versus private individuals, privacy versus everything being shared, and centralized versus decentralized. So let me go into my first theme. And you can already see I'm using the analogy of Matrix to guide us through this debate. Quick reminder, the red bill is open your eyes and be your own agent. The blue pill is continue in your ignorance. First one up is cryptocurrencies. Of course, not a new form of money, but my prediction is in future scenario A, which in my view is a red pill scenario, that we will have easier ways to create those. They will be more specialized for use cases, including, for example, financial crime facilitation, because cash will be less and less in the market. But we also will see positive developments, such as community coins, that can really address community sustainability in more closed loop systems. Future scenario B, in my view, would be the blue pill, where cryptos will just die out, maybe they get hacked, people lose trust in them, and instead we will see more centralized approaches by governments to create regional, globally exchangeable currencies, so maybe a currency for the African continent and a currency in Europe which goes maybe beyond the euro. Next one up, we have uh, business private money as a use case. Will government step in and stop Facebook from issuing DiEM? That's one scenario. The other scenario could be that big techs themselves will all issue some form of currency or coin, and that will commercially start to erode central bank issued money, public money per se. Both scenarios are very centralized, and both scenarios are therefore, in my view, blue pills to swallow. What would be the third one? My favorite, central bank digital currencies. And here we have an interesting case of a blue pill. If central banks go down the route of issuing account-based uh, central bank digital currencies with full control of individuals, digital identity and money is linked. You can be in a situation uh, similar to Corbin Dallas in 1997 in the fifth element. No, pay, no play, no pay, internet of things. You can't drive your taxi because you haven't paid your insurance. We also have done a situation where central banks can pass on interest rates, negative or positive, um, and we have no privacy. The other one would be, of course, the other token-based scenario where you have privacy and you exchange it similarly to cash. Programmable money, next one. Red scenario, controlled by individuals, by the community, a lot of self-agency influence, or in the blue scenario, controlled by governments, the ecosystem. And there you can have scenarios where money is under your skin and it tells you you can't buy that third cupcake of the day because your health sugar levels are too high and your health insurance is not going to be paid otherwise. You could also have creation of money vintages encouraging spending of money. On the cross-border side, I don't think we will have in 2040 a global currency, but we will have now regional currencies and we will have competing global payment systems. Money and information will be intertwined. We will have smart money. We have move, seamless movement between different types of monies on an off-ramp and FX will be zero. What a great red future that would be, much more decentralized. The other future, of course, would be that we keep going down the rabbit hole of our global big techs, swallow the blue pill and let them design not only money, but the single single payment rail across which everything will flow. So let me start to conclude. We really have <clears throat> a fight between independence and dependence. And my prediction, which is a very logical one, is that the future will be riddled by more and more environmental disasters. If we continue with our blue pill scenario of digital dependency and reduce the reduction of your, our own single agency, we will be so dependent that once the lights go off, the music will effectively stop. If you think about backups on mobile phone masks for a few hours in the UK or broadband only two hours, BT landlines have actually backup of 14 days. So maybe the future of money is a fax if uh, basically everything else around breaks down. But I would like to ask the audience and everybody to think about how we can create a more decentralized future where we are more in control, where privacy is preserved, and where it's not about only the convenience of being lulled into some digital uh, sort of phantasma, but where it's really about responsibility, community, um, and using technology for the right means to help our environment and our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth, and an impressive feat to build such a complex image of the future. I'm sure that the people tuning in from home, and thank you all for being with us, are already thinking which way they're going to um, cast their vote. We only have one question, time for one question, uh, but please stay with us, start counting your money. Hi, Kevin, and we will come back to you in a second. James, you're the chosen one for the single question to Ruth. 
What's your question? What? Well, firstly, um, I mean, fantastic job, Ruth. I'm, I'm really beginning to think us uh, leaders have the easy job here, right? The pitchers are, are, are putting tremendous effort in. And I actually maybe just make the note that we haven't seen any of this in advance. So um, we're kind of seeing it uh, live at the same time as everybody else. So really great job, Ruth. A couple of observations and a quick question. Loved the reference to the fifth element. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, the competing global payment systems, and I think Ruth did incorporate, you know, what I mentioned at the start around a kind of a regional view. I mean, there's no, well, I, I would say there's unlikely to be a globally consistent standard. So I thought that was fascinating. I would love to uh, dive a little deeper. Uh, I think the, the environmental point you made at the end as well is, is, is tremendously impactful and would love to hear a little bit more on that. So my question in brief, um, you know, we tend to use the phrase that, you know, technologies or the effect of them is overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term. What technologies do you think today or, or business models or concepts that exist today do you think we are underestimating the impact of uh, when it pertains to the, the future of money? And then what ones might we be overestimating the impact of? Ruth, a hard question and yeah, you have about 10 seconds to answer it in. <laughs> I think the most the guiding principle should be that technology sh should serve humanity and environment rather than the other way around. And my big point in that presentation was around thinking about decentralized structures, structures where you have more individual and community influence as opposed to everything being centralized because you have too much dependency and not enough flexibility. And you can choose technologies accordingly to fulfill that brief. An amazing answer and a very pithy one. We could spend hours on each of the pitches, I'm sensing, but we don't have hours. So we'll move on to our next pitch and an alternative view of the future. Theo, take it away. Thank you so much and hello everyone. My name is Theodora Lau and I'm the founder of Unconventional Ventures. Thank you, Lita, and thank you everyone for having me here today at the first Future of Money Tribal session. What is the future of money? Um, well, we can't really talk about the future of money without talking about the future of humanity and the role that money plays in it. Throughout history, money in different shapes and forms have enabled the development of social and economic systems in different civilizations, allowing us to trade goods and services and enable us to save for the future. From paper money to mobile payments and digital currency, Regardless of what forms they take and what medium they transit, they are still a means to an end. We are at a crossroad. We have choices to make, important choices that will impact what the future holds, and not just for banking, but also the world at large. I want to take you to a travel. The year is 2040. One in four U.S. workers are older than 55. And in 10 years' time, one in four people in Europe and North America will be aged 65 and over. Poverty levels skyrocketed in developed economies as mass automation continues and countries have largely failed to retrain and upskill their workers. Divides between the coastal elites and flyover states widen, and many developing economies, urban, poor, and rural communities have yet to recover from the economic downturn that happened after COVID-19 resulting in 70, 700 million people in extreme poverty. The gains in life expectancy in previous years have been erased due to deteriorating air quality, water shortage, and the rise of infectious disease. And those who can afford to, the 1% of the 1%, have isolated themselves in special built cities. And you ask, what is the most important currency on earth in that version of 2040. There will be access to clean water and clean air. Does this sound like a dystopian future? Perhaps. But could this be a plausible future, though, if we were to continue to the current path? At the end of the day, it's about the choices that we make today and how we, use, we choose to use technology. What business models do we support and what solutions we create and for whom we serve? What priorities do we make? And all of us, each and every single one of us, have a personal responsibility. So now let's consider a different scenario. The year is still 2040, and we are able to meet our goal of eradicating global poverty. Even though population aging continues worldwide, automation has helped to maintain productivity that we need. 
and contingent work with multi-generational workforce has become a common trend, with private sectors continuing to promote a friendly work culture and innovation economies flourish worldwide as more women, communities of color, and rural communities are able to connect digitally and gain access to formal financial services. And through the rich and diverse brain power from all corners of the earth, we're able to find innovative solutions to solve our climate crisis. We have yet to reach gender equality, but we are closer than ever. And in this future, we recognize that while talent is everywhere, opportunities are not, but we can, as an industry, change the status quo. What will be the most important currency on earth in this future? We recognize that we have a collective responsibility to the society and that the action of one can have an impact on the world. The currency that we talk about is purpose. When their profits and purpose are expected to coexist, a world where we have complete ownership of our data and where we can dictate on how to use it for social good. Does this sound utopian, perhaps? But could this be a possible future, though? With purposeful actions, this can be our future, I would argue, our collective future, one that leaves a legacy for our children and generations to come. Because to me, a rich life has nothing to do with money. And here I'll ask you if you do have a wish list to map us for the next 20, 40, 100 years, where would you like for us to go? Can we then reimagine a new future with our actions of today? I hope the past few minutes give you some food for thought. I believe that the decisions we make in life matter and that everyone can make a difference in the communities they live and those that are fortunate to serve. And I believe in the power of hope, which is what we need today. So thank you. Theo, in five minutes, you managed to throw me into absolute despair and then give me some hope. And I think the people at home feel the same way. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking of throwing this to Lana, who was talking about public purpose. But I am going to mix it all up and actually throw it to Thomas and say, did this give you the mix of realism action, purpose, and despair that you were looking for. Do you have a question for Theo Thomas? Yeah, I feel like I've, I felt the full range of emotions uh, as, as you did, and I think the audience did as well. So uh, it was a nice, uh, a nice ending, and I, I think the, the, the purpose one is, a, is an important message. You know, one of the, one of the things that um, I think about when, the, when we're talking about purpose and, and community is who actually gets to make the decisions? How are these decisions made, you know, in terms of how do you prioritize purpose? You know, you, you mentioned, you know, three uh, issues that are hugely important to every aspect of the world today with climate and, and income inequality and, and, and clean air and, and water. Who gets to make those decisions in, in, uh, in this model to actually uh, end up in a situation where, where, where purpose really does become the goal of the, uh, of the monetary system? Well, and, and I have 10, 10 seconds, Lita. 14. <laughs> I, I would say that is a tough question. <laughs> 14. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Um, I just wasted four. Uh, I, I think that collectively we, we need to. I don't think it's a, it's a decision of one. But if you were to ask all three of them, I believe that economic inequality is a human right. And that's the first thing that we need to solve for um, because everything else comes with it there in my 10 second answer. Absolutely brilliant. I bet the people at home Thank you, thought they knew how they were voting when Ruth finished. Now they're thinking, oh my God, this just got a lot harder and it's about to get harder still. Last but absolutely not least, Matt's vision of the future. Thank you so much, Lita. Thank you to everyone for having me here. Um, when I first started investing in FinTech companies, in 2000, there was one main idea, that an analog sector would eventually become digital. The potential was obvious. Here was a multi-trillion dollar industry filled with atoms. Think bank branches, paper documents, human labor, when all it ever needed was bytes. And the transition to digital has and, and will continue to reduce the friction, transaction costs of 
buying and using financial services ultimately to zero. Perhaps five years ago, the next leg of the journey became obvious. Once financial services were digital, they no longer needed to exist as discrete products. They could become embedded in software that consumers and businesses use all day long and with which they have a durable, data-rich relationship. We're early in that process, and it frankly requires imagination to see where it ends. For a while, it's just going to feel like everyone we do business with wants to offer us a debit card or make us a loan or help us save 15% on our car insurance. But eventually, when these products and services are all fully digital, fully embedded, the cognitive load of opening and managing these accounts will go away as the operations are executed and automated by the software within which they're integrated. But even more recently, with the mainstreaming of crypto and Web3, the final piece of this complete revolution has snapped into place. One of the reasons we have such fixed notions of what financial services can be is because of this analog history. You know, high frictional costs led to standardization, just like in manufacturing when we had this primitive industrialization. You had one type of car. And, you know, through advances in manufacturing techniques, we had, you know, all sorts of combinations of makes, models, and features. So advances in digitization uh, will help that problem. But the other reason we have these standard plain vanilla products is that financial services is highly centralized. The ru rules of the road are established and maintained by regulators, financial institutions, and their collective associations. When your money instead lives in a set of cryptographically secure wallets, the full flower of human imagination can be brought to bear in determining the potential of those accounts. So for this digital, embedded, decentralized world to reach its full potential, there are meaningful problems to be solved. Uh, we have to be able to establish identity at the point of transaction and over time, even if it's pseudonymous. We must have real-time and persistent credit risk management for people, businesses, and for the very specific obligations between and among them. We must have reliable cryptographic security in a world without center, central counterparties to resolve disputes. And we must solve money supply chain problems requiring robust, time-tested capital allocation algorithms so that excess supply in one place can be a source of liquidity elsewhere in real time. This transition from an analog, productized, centralized industry of the past to a digital, embedded, decentralized one underpinned by these advances in identity, risk management, info security, and the globalization and atomization of liquidity it's going to lead to an industry characterized by automation like we've never seen before, by abundance and creativity, displacing the friction, the cognitive load, and conformity of the past. We'll have financial relationships with all of our commercial counterparties. We'll nearly have as many wallets as we have transactions. So let's talk about these wallets for a second. Um, merchants of all types will present customers with two main options. Store money with me, and I will reward you, or pay me later with little or no expense. And as a consumer moves through his or her commercial life, he or she will constantly be flipping back and forth between net borrower or net lender with each of their counterparties, depending on other calls on their capital and the quality of the deals on offer. A consumer could, if pressed, you know, verbalize their current situation and characterize how it's changing. Like, I just swept all my merchant balances and will now leverage buy now, pay later offers for the next three weeks while also pulling down my next quarter's wages so I can allocate capital into the Latin American transportation sector given a short-term outsized return available there. Uh, but these choices generally will not be overt or even conscious. And smaller merchants like will not have sophisticated treasury teams managing their liquidity and structuring these offers. Algorithms, protocols, global pools of liquidity serve as their back office as well. What's in these wallets? Well, you know, by 2040, we will largely be done with the bad trade that is fiat currency, where we give our capital for free to the government for the privilege of having it diluted by the tax of inflation. Instead, uh, you know, our current conception of money, this token that is a representation of an entry in a central bank ledger, instead of that, our assets will be 100% invested at all times, but still entirely liquid through the mechanic of stable coins. As mentioned, money has historically had a supply chain problem in an analog, productized, and centralized world. 
causing us to store it in various expensive and inefficient depots around our lives. But in the future, money will be just in time. And the big question, what are the implications? What are governments and financial institutions going to do about this radically transformed future? I don't know the answer. I know what I hope, which is that they embrace it and don't start a new Cold War on the government side and don't lean into enhanced regulation, but instead welcome a progressive and open future. But your guess is as good as mine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Lana, one question to rule them all. Absolutely fascinating, very detailed vision. Um, you know, as a person who studies technology, I always think about the way that very, very unoften in the history of technology, and particularly money technology, do we see a total displacement of one technology by the other. Rather, it's a layering um, where, you know, certain forms become dominant in different times, but but rarely do others die out completely. Um, so, and one thing I didn't, I heard an amazing um, vision for really operating model in your uh, presentation, but I didn't hear as thorough, I mean, I know you only had five minutes, but I didn't hear as thorough a vision for infrastructure. How does this get delivered? What are the actual technological underpinnings? Um, so I'm curious how you see that playing out and what is the role of old technologies? Is there a vision for cash in, in your world in 2040, even if it isn't the dominant payment system? Well, let me just say that I've, I've been an incrementalist my whole career. I mean, I work at Bain Capital. I, I'm not a radical revolutionary. And it is only recently, frankly, through watching and investing the last four years in decentralized finance that I've come to the conclusion that that historical pattern you mentioned of layering and evolution is actually no longer going to be the pattern. That decentralization in its fullest flower actually overthrows what came before it rather than gets layered into it and on top of it. So the liberating function of 19 years of future to play with led me to the belief that unlike historical advances in money technology, we're going to see something entirely new and radically disruptive. And on that revolutionary note, with the banner snapping in the air, what a set of presentations we've had. Leaders, I'm buying you a few seconds before I come back to you to ask you how you're voting. Can I say a big thank you on behalf of everyone to our amazing pitchers? It is not easy to paint such radically different visions of the future in five minutes or less. And you have all three have done this in spades. A lot to think about, uh, a lot of emotions, a lot of ideas. And I know the folks at home are frantic figuring out how to spend their coins. Now, Slido will be open and everyone at home watching this will be able to cast a vote soon. Um, you are a uh, one man, woman, one vote set up at home, whereas our judges here have a bigger pot to invest with. And that means that they have the option, should they choose to take it, to actually split their vote. Uh, of course, the more split their votes are, the more your vote at home matters. So we will go to our judges in a second, give each of them a couple of minutes to tell us what they're voting for, how hard the choice was, and why. Um, in the meantime, keep an eye on Slido, get your coins ready, because you'll be casting your vote very soon. James, I'll come to you first. Um, who will you be voting for and why? Wow. So, um, I mean, firstly, you know, three great presentations, I think, you know, all very different. Uh, it was super interesting, frankly, to see how they complement each other and then are kind of competitive in other ways as well. So I just think a, a really interesting debate all around. Thank you for that. Um, Lita, remind me, I've got a, is it 100 Inno coins or 1,000? I believe you have 1,000. Someone talk in my ear now, if that's not correct, or forever hold wow. your peace. That's correct. <laughs> Okay, well, so on the basis of 1,000, um, I'm going to be a little bit of a politician about this, by I which I mean I'm going to spread the largesse a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's a friendly future of money community here. But um, look, I've, I've got points to make on each of them, but I know we don't quite have time for it. So maybe let me come down and just say, I think if I can, if I can, donate or invest, I should say. Uh, I think I'll go 500 with Ruth. Um, I, I just think in particular, I felt like there was a little bit of a, a global perspective there that was perhaps slightly missing. Um, 
for for a couple of the others in terms of that kind of regionalization I, I spoke about. And I think, again, kind of sitting in Asia, I often think, uh, you know, we've got a slightly different perspective in, in terms of how things are headed, um, et cetera. So I'd love to give 500 to Ruth or invest 500 in Ruth. And then uh, being the kind of quasi-politician that I am, I'm going to sp split the rest evenly uh, between Theo and Matt, both of whom did an excellent job. So 500, 250, 250. You guys are going to test my, my arithmetic skills as we go. Um, but, a, but a fair assessment, the, the visions we saw are competing and coexisting. There is a world where all of it could come true or not. Uh, get your votes ready at home, guys. It will be opening soon. Lana, how are you spreading your largesse? Yes, I, James beat me to it. I'm having a hard time making my decision as well. These were all great visions. And really, they're not mutually exclusive. They're not incompatible. We can imagine a world where some of the technical infrastructure described by Ruth, um, some of the, the kind of public policy adoptions that she um, described are adopted. Um, we can also imagine a world where a lot of the kind of operating model and the, you know, production of, of the technical, of the financial instruments um, is, is what we saw in Matt's vision. And we can also imagine a world where kind of the social surround is what uh, Theodora described. So I'm having a really hard time uh, making the decision. Um, one thing, you know, I, I liked about Matt's is that as, you know, Tom described it, it really is a bold vision. He took a stand. He didn't, uh, he, he took a stand, he described it in detail, and I appreciate that. At the same time, that kind of strong stance uh, to me makes it a, it's a strong claim is harder to prove, if you will. Um, so I, I did think Ruth's vision was probably the most realistic in part because it offered, it was a little bit more vague <laughs> and it offered more opportunities um, for fleshing it out in different dimensions. So I'm just gonna have to go, um, I think I'm actually going to vote the exact same way that, uh, that James did. I'm gonna go half of it to Ruth and the split the difference, the, the other um, half split the, between uh, Theodora and, um, and Matt. Fantastic. And that, uh, as you guys at home can work out, is putting Ruth in the lead, but not in a way that is irreversible. And I must admit, when we started talking about this session, I was gutted I didn't have a vote. And now I'm actually really relieved because I would spend the rest of the time going, oh, my God, what do I do with, with my money? What do I do with my vote? It feels like it matters a lot because we take a stand for the future as well as um, giving our view on other people's uh, view. Thomas, are you going to reverse this trend? Are you going to be the kingmaker? <laughs> yeah, how did I end up number three? Um, it was entirely accidental, sorry. <laughs> I guess that's, those are the straws we drew before the session started. Um, th these are fascinating proposals, and, and they give you so much to, to think about um, in so many different ways and so many different aspects. You know, the marker of 2040 is way out there. I, I said earlier that I was looking for a bold vision and specific benefits, and, and, and I do like um, something that's a little bit more concrete in terms of uh, the proposal, even though... That seems like a long ways away. We know uh, 20 years flies by in no time at all. So um, I, I also was um, struck with, uh, with Matt's proposal around kind of the key ingredients that, that are there. So regardless of where this goes, centralized, decentralized, you know, sovereign versus individual, Ruth, I think, laid out very nicely um, the trade-offs between the two. Um, there's certain things that just have to be there. Uh, and and if, again, things are gonna change. But we have to know who we're dealing with, right? So things like identity matter. Cryptology has to work because it has to be secure to have confidence for anybody to use it. So um, I think I think the, the the concrete part of the proposal, even though it's longer term, really resonated with me and and specifically around where where Matt was taking us, um, including some of the history and how we got here. And I know in the conversations I've had with Lon in the past, it's very important to think about you know uh, where we're going based on where we came from in regards to how radical the change will be. So I'm going to, I'm going to break the trend a little bit. And I know that um, our audience is going to uh, vote as well. I feel a little pressure coming off with that, but I'm happy to um, allocate a thousand, uh, all of my coins, all of my inner coins um, to Matt and his proposal. Wow. 
fantastic and thank you for this and thank you to all of our judges. Obviously, depending on what you guys do at home, you've worked out that Thomas was our kingmaker in this one. Uh, you will, in a second, uh, get a chance to potentially reverse this. Um, but what I hope you will remember from this session, which, as I said, is the first ever session of its kind, is the strength of the pitches, the um, fragility of what looks like a very robust vision and how much the choices we make now as an industry, as institutions, as, as individuals will determine which way we're inching forward. I, I sure hope we'll get a chance to reality check ourselves in the years to come as part of tribal uh, sessions revisited. But before we declare a final winner, before we figure out what actually swung the vote, the vote at home matters. This is your time. Clickers on the buzzers, guys. You should be able to access the Slido. And if I've timed this well, there should be some background music starting soon. And you'll have about 45 seconds. So no, this is not the time to go get a drink. Hello, everyone. This is not the time to go get a drink. This is not the time to check your messages. 45 seconds and I'm hoping I can start seeing the tickers on my screen. I have some privileged access sitting here in the studio, obviously. I feel like dancing too. I hope someone is recording the dancing sequence because I want it as a screensaver for the rest of my life. You guys are amazing. Oh, look at that. I take it back. This is the best bit of the session. are voting at the same time as making my day because the window is closing soon. Hey, Tony. Look at that. This is very exciting. You can't see it, but I can, seeing the, the colored bars. That's... The vote has closed. The vote is cast. I see percentages. I hope someone will calculate the coins for me. Um, part of me doesn't want to tell you who the winner is, because I really hope that what you're left remembering isn't who won, but what you heard today and, and what, it is we, uh, what it is we learned today, what it is we had to think about. Um, you heard how our judges voted. The audience vote went slightly a different way. In fact, it went more James's way, declaring Ruth our overall winner, uh, not by a majority, by a strong enough lead, and then splitting almost evenly between our two other um, ideas and pitches for the future. Frankly, I don't think anyone will remember who won, although well done, Ruth, and well done, everyone. I think everyone will remember how you made us feel, what you made us think about, and most of all, what you all three flagged, the choices we have to make today for the dystopian future to be avoided, for the more constructive future to be plausible and possible, the ingredients of the future that you all brought to life in slightly different ways that we all have to invest in. Um, I really hope everyone at home has enjoyed this as much as we have. Uh, I hope that you will use your feedback sessions to tell us that you absolutely want the tribal session back because frankly, I'd love to come back for it. It has been absolutely brilliant. This was both logistically and in terms of content quite a challenge and you guys have been an 
absolute amazing lineup, packing more ideas in the space of a few minutes than I have ever seen, even by cyber standards. And seeing the smiling faces and the little dances of everyone at home has reminded us all what it is we've been missing in the last couple of years when we have had the amazing Cybos content, but the not the amazing Cybos community nearby. And yet here you were, uh, giving us that incredibly hopeful, warm and fuzzy feeling at the end of what has been a harrowing, challenging, but very uplifting session. From the studio in London, a big thank you to our leaders, a big thank you to our pitchers. You've done an incredible job. A big thank you to the audience at home. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for dancing with us. Thank you for voting. And I hope to see you all very, very soon, hopefully in person, for the second tribal session next year. <laughs>